So we're continuing on with chapter six today, and apparently only some of my screens are going to be working. There we go. That's better. All right. Um, so just as a review of what we talked about on Monday, we were looking at when we wrapped up, we were looking at multiple performance obligations in a contract, how to break those out. Essentially, you take the fair values of the items that are within that contract separately, take those separate values, add them together to get like what the total fair market value is of those items added together. And then you take the market price of each and divide it by the combined market price to get what percentage of the combined fair market value they are. And that percentage is then multiplied times the actual contract cost to identify the revenue portion that would be associated with each of those different performance obligations. All right. Um, and then for the portion that is related to product that is immediately being delivered, um, you would credit sales revenue for anything that's immediately delivered and fully complete. And anything that goes out over time, like a service contract or an extended warranty or something, um, would be credited to deferred revenue so that you could uh, adjust that and record it gradually to revenue um, on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on how often you're doing your financial statement adjustments. Okay. So, um, what happens if you're having trouble determining, like, so we can say, hey, this is the dollar value that gets put on a contract, but sometimes there might be situations where what that contract is actually worth to us is not the same as like, say, the dollar amount written on there, either because we have doubts about whether all of it will be collected or maybe there are contingencies involved where like part of it only becomes um, payable if certain things occur. So we're going to talk about how some of those items work and when we would take them into consideration. All right. So um, variable consideration um, is when you have potentially different amounts that could be recorded depending on what activities occur. Um, if you have a right of return um, within a contract, within say a certain amount of time that could also potentially influence when you would uh, recognize revenue, especially if there's no penalty associated with it. Um, at determining whether somebody who is initiating a purchase is actually a valid principal or agent of the company that's buying. Um, like if you know that somebody's a, a, a valid decision maker versus whether you have reason to think that they are not a valid decision maker, that would affect whether this has occurred. And a lot of this is like kind of related to contract law. And then the other thing that uh, sometimes comes into consideration is the time value of money, which we just spent a whole chapter talking about. Um, the present value of a stream of payments might lead you to a different sales price if there's not a um, an interest component already taken into consideration within the contract. And then also, um, what are the payments that are being made? Um, if, if there are payments being made uh, by the seller to the customer. So um, that would be like, maybe you're trading two items for something and there's an additional cash portion added on or something of that nature. So we'll go through some different examples of each of these and what they, how they would shake out from a journal entry and accounting standpoint here. All right, so under variable consideration, part of the transaction price uh, has to have trigger events that happen. So things like um, 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 commissions are one example, um, incentive payments on construction. So uh, who here's, I know some, at least one person here's got some uh, construction ex experience and can tell us about what that means, incentive payments for construction. Anyone wanna jump in? If not, I can mention it, no? Okay, so you've got a contract to build the student center out front, right? Or the I-35 interchange. And if the I, we'll, we'll do the I-35 interchange. Or eh, 
Student Center works too. Either one. Which one? Which one should I do? Student Center. Student Center. Okay. All right. So the planned. <laughs> we'll do both. We'll do both. All right. Uh, planned. Planned deployment date for the Student Center is next August. Right. What happens if they're late? Dude, that that sucks. Huh? That sucks. It sucks. But like, what? Like, what do we have out front that will disappear when the construction is done? A big, huge, messy construction zone, oh, right? Yeah. Right, and and half of a half of a parking lot that's missing. Yeah. So we want. I mean, if you think about this construction timeline, ideally, this would be done, cleaned up, and looking beautiful in time for students to arrive on Labor Day weekend in 2024, right? If it's not, people can't drive up to the building. We can't get furniture in there. there then there's going to be like after school starts there will be you know some chaos as stuff is moving in and out of that building and 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 people are trying to change offices when they're also trying to serve students and all that kind of stuff right so it's worthwhile for us to have that done by the early august date that's supposed to be done so we have time to get all that chaos out of the way before our busy season right um so what you might write into a contract like that is um we will pay you a incentive payment of X number of dollars to be completed by uh, by a timely construction date of say, I think it's like August 13th, I don't know, whatever the date is in August, and an additional bonus number of thousands of dollars if you can complete it like um, four weeks earlier than that, right? Um, with the I-35 construction potentially would be like same concept, right? You've got one of the most complex road construction projects in the states in like the recent history for this state that has many parts to it, right? Because we have a freeway, we have a highway coming down 53 from the mall, which needs to connect to Highway 53 going over to Superior. We've got people getting on and off from Lincoln Park on 21st Avenue West. Uh, up just a very short distance up, we've got another exit 27th Avenue West. We've got uh, a major freight um, port area down on Garfield Avenue that also merges in there. So there's about like seven or eight different major heavy duty entry and exit points for this project, all of which are very high traffic. Um, and if you do the, and they have to be done in certain orders, right? Because you can't construct, you know, this part here that's supporting that before you build that and, and what, you know, has anyone heard about the most recent delay? Yeah, they discovered um, um, items of historical significance. Um, and it sounds like it might have been like dead body, um, like, like a graveyard or something. Huh? Huh? I really said Austin's another 16 years. So they're they're saying it's going to be only only a year delay, yeah. but still, so, but it's also but it's delaying also the fifty three bridge project, which was supposed to start last week because of when they started moving something as well. So anyway, um, important to maintain historical artifacts, and if if your family was the one who had your remains buried there and you discovered it after the fact, you'd be pretty upset. If people were just like driving over with a tractor, so understandable why they need to be respectful of the uh findings that they have there but hopefully we'll all we'll all uh hope that it gets taken care of and addressed all right that that will be a uh that will be a detractor however on their incentive payments for their construction plan okay um entertainment and media uh royalties that would occur right so think about a movie that comes out um, a lot of entertainment contracts for actors, writers, uh, studios, and whatnot, um, especially for actors and people who do like art on the films, like you know CGI, all that kind of stuff, where they get paid a royalty. A relatively small amount of what they get paid is actually the time to create the film, and then it's how does it do in theaters afterwards, right? And they all get their little micro percentage of the takings from that point onward. So, but you don't know how well a movie is gonna do until after it goes, right? Like the Barbie <laughs> movie could easily have just been like a complete flop, right? Instead it made like record billions of dollars or whatever. Um, so you don't know how much revenue to uh, recognize on, on that one until after your royalties come in. If you're somebody who provided say technical 
CGI design services or something for Broadway. All right, and then um, healthcare. It's very common, not just for Medicare and Medicaid, but also for insurance companies to contractually um, bargain down costs that are paid out for healthcare services in the United States. Um, so a hospital may not necessarily know exactly what they're going to get in revenue until after they do that bargaining. All right, so what do all of these have uh, in common? There's, they also have manufacturing discounts for volume purchases, rebates for telecommunications and whatnot. You have to come up with a way of uh, estimating how much you actually think you're going to get out of this because you can't just like wait until like 10 years from now to record your revenues from the Barbie movie, right? You need to have some number to record. So um, expected value is one way of calculating that. If any of you have taken financial management, um, you've done some basic, it's like a weighted average calculation. You take the number of potential scenarios and the probability that each of those will occur, multiply them out, add them, add the weighted um, probabilities together. We'll go through that, don't, don't worry about it, um, to come up with an overall expected percentage of uh, collectability that you'll get. Um, the most likely amount, let's say you've got three amounts and you say, well, we have a lawsuit coming in and we're going to make a bunch of money on this, but we don't like the most, we, the high end remote possibility is this amount, the low end is that amount, but the most likely amount is somewhere in the middle. Um, that's another method you could choose. Um, basically what you have to do is there's going to be some judgment that has to be applied as to which will likely be the most accurate method. Okay. Um, so looking at an example here, uh, True Tech is entering a contract with Pro Sports Gaming to add online games to their gaming network. And they have games uh, like Brawl of Bands. What, what game would that be ripping on? Like spinning off of like Guitar Hero <laughs> from like 800 years ago? I don't know. Uh, Brawl of Bands and wants those games on the Trinet so Pro Sport can sell gems, weapons, health potions, and other game features to allow players to advance more quickly in a game. Okay, so terms of the contract. On January 1st, 2024, there's an upfront fixed fee of $300,000 for six months of featured access. And then Pro Sport will also pay TrueTech a bonus of $180,000 if Trinet users access Pro Sport games for at least 15,000 hours during the six month period. All right. Um, they estimate a 75% chance that they will achieve that usage target and receive the $180,000 bonus for that, okay? So what do we do then? I mean, the, the $300,000 received up front, that's just a flat fee to get started. That's easy, right? Debit cash, credit deferred revenue, Q scratching record. Why are we deferring that instead of just putting it right to revenue? Finish the service yeah, because it's a six month service provision, right? So we're going to put that to deferred revenue. We're going to record a portion of it each month for um, uh, uh, six months. Now, um, if we are doing the expected value method for the other portion, if we say that there is a 75% chance that we're going to get the overall $480,000, we would multiply that out. That gives us $360,000. So that 480 is the 300,000 plus the 180,000. Um, that leaves us with a 25% chance that we will not get our bonus, which means that all we will get is the $300,000. So the expected value of that uh, times the uh, percentage is 75,000. So if we add those two together, Mathematically, based on how likely we think this is to happen, we think that we would get $435,000 on average in this situation. Like if we were to do this like eight times, on average, we get 435. So we've already recorded the um, $300,000 part. Now, if we, um, so that would be, 
what we would record overall then, 435. If we were going to value this using the most likely amount, then we would just go with the one that was the 75% chance, which would be the 480,000. And then we would just recognize that at $80,000 per month, if we did not make it, then we would end up adjusting it to actual at the end. Okay. Now, um, uh, how they are recording this out, however, so that they can track it separately is they're using a bonus receivable account because we we received cash for the three hundred thousand, um, and then the remaining part uh, is just it's a we're going to put that out there and record rateably each month thirty thousand uh, dollars of the receivable, which is the $180,000 bonus amount total divided by the six months, okay? So for each month, um, $300,000 divided by six is $50,000. So we're gonna debit our deferred revenue account for the $50,000. And then we're going to debit our bonus receivable account, which is an asset for $30,000. And then we're gonna credit service revenue for the two. So total of $80,000. All right. Now, um, let's see here. Then when we receive the bonus, all we have to do is debit cash and then credit bonus receivable. Yes. So is bonus receivable not a revenue because it's not a normal income? Well, so we record, we did record it to revenue here, right? So if you look back here, um, we recorded $30,000 in revenue per month included in this $80,000 amount. So basically we just kind of like, we're dividing it out over the six months. <clears throat> okay. Now, if we don't receive that bonus, we actually have to unrecord that $180,000 that we recorded. So we would do a debit to service revenue to just pull that out and then a uh, credit to bonus receivable. So we just basically back out the $180,000 portion um, like it never happened. Now, what's kind of problematic about that? If you think about like all these entries we've made and, and then the final adjusting entry, if we don't get it. It could affect your net income and the tax return. Um, I mean, possibly if you have it like straddling a year, that would be not cool. Um, but yeah, so it would be worst case scenario if it was straddling a year because it would affect potentially two different uh, tax things. But um, with respect to this, like we've got income in all these previous months that will continue to sit there in those previous months even though we're never actually collecting it. And then we're going to have a big hit in June, which will, which sort of distorts some of your monthly finance, your interim financial reporting for those periods. Um, fortunately for this example, it closed out in June, which is a common quarterly uh, end. So it would, it would group multiple months into one quarter, but even so, um, All right, so now let's say what happens if, so that's assuming that we go through the whole thing being like, yes, we're gonna get there, we're gonna get there. And then, oh no, we didn't at the end. More likely scenario is that we're trying this out. We have grandiose ideas about what might happen, but if it's gonna tank, it's probably gonna like pretty obviously tank right away. So here we've come up with this great uh, idea. We've recorded three months worth of um, income and then we went yeah I guess that's not such not working out as hot as we thought it would and we're we're probably not going to get that bonus you don't keep recording the monthly ones once you've realized hey we're 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 not going to get there let's just you know let it go so um then you would um back out that entry up to whatever amounts you've recorded when you make the realization that you're no longer going to get those revenues. So just being straightforward, they got three months in, they recorded $90,000 worth of revenue and then said, yeah, we're not going to happen. So they credited 
um, bonus receivable, debited, service revenue, and back those amounts out of there. And then after that, for the remaining months, they're just going to record the $50,000 that they're reclassifying out of deferred revenue um, into that account. Okay. All righty. So let's go out here. So let's look at this. This first, this problem number four here is an example that ties to the expected value method that we talked about first. So if we're gonna do this, just make this a little bit bigger. There we are. We wrote a contract for a hundred thousand dollar sale of tires, and we anticipate uh, a slightly greater than fifty percent chance that um, Garden will be able to pay the amounts that Tulane is entitled to receive under the contract. Upon delivery of the tires, assuming no payment has yet been made by Garden, how much revenue would we recognize in this case? if we're doing this under the expected value format. Actually, I think they might be. <laughs> we'll talk about this under the expected value, but then we'll, uh, they might actually be getting at decision modes here in this question. So I might have to walk this back, but if we're doing an expected value calculation, what would we multiply together here? We do 100,000 x Yes, yep. So $50,000, obviously we could do that in our head, but um, we'll just double check. They might be actually doing a theory question here and, and be, yeah, okay. So going back, we're gonna talk about contingencies. All right, here we go. I got ahead of, actually, hold on a second. Let me look at what other ones we have out there. I think they want us to be uh, doing the next section applying to that, but I know I had some problems in here. All right, let's look at number five here. This is one we can definitely do. We've got eLearn, that is an online fitness community offering access to workout routines, nutrition advice, and eLean coaches. Customers pay a $50 fee to become registered on the website and then pay $5 per month uh, for access to all the eLean services. How many performance obligations exist in the implied contract when a customer registers for the services? One. Yeah, so the registration fee um, just basically gets them the account and then, um, and then, the $5 per month access is its own kind of separate con or the monthly continuing access would be a separate, um, separate example. So let's see here. What did they, um, I'm here with their, oh, they're just having us check which ones are. Okay. So we've got the, Registration on the website, right? Um, is the access to eLean services likely to be separate from the registration on the website in this case? <laughs> Would you do one without the other? That's really the question here. Probably not, no. So here they did not mention a standalone. They just, they mentioned that there's an ongoing fee so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna agree with you that it's one performance obligation. And then um, really the access to the services uh, ultimately, um, you wouldn't be registering if you didn't want to access the services, right? So all right. So they checked both of these, but they're both, um, inherently the same thing. Yeah, two parts of the same process. Okay. All 
All right, so this uh, problem right here, problem number six, this walks through the uh, breaking out the pricing between separate performance obligations that uh, we talked about. So this, this one will actually be a little review back to what we talked about on Wednesday. All right, so take a minute and work with the person next to you and then take a stab at this one. I'll do it on paper and then I'll throw it up there in a minute. Oh, they don't even have us calculated, do they? They're just asking about the number of obligations. Oh, okay, well. So this one's going to go back to um, one, a, a kind of a small point we talked about on Wednesday, which was the difference between implied warranty of fitness versus extended warranties. All right. So what did they tell us about uh, warranty of fitness? Anyone remember? So the original warranty, like the original short-term warranty that comes with a product typically is deemed to be um, what's called an implied warranty of fitness, which is like you wouldn't buy it with the expectation that it would be broken. They're obligated to provide you with a functional product. And so they're saying like our guarantee is that you're getting a product that will function for one year. So that one actually is the, the basic one-year warranty doesn't constitute a separate performance obligation because it's just buying an accepted product basically. Um, so then, um, so in that implied contract for the purchase of a vacuum cleaner then, um, I think it's one for the, uh, I think that the items that you have are the um, option to purchase a three-year extended warranty is its own separate purchase. And then the, um, delivery and functionality for the one year is a um is a single obligation that's what i'm going with we'll see what they say oh they're going for more did they go for two hmm. yeah they're kind of contradicting themselves on that one but all right we'll go I suppose it's because it's one year and not like 90 days. That's probably where it's at. <clears throat> that would be the justification there. Okay. I had different ones checkmarked and it said I was completely correct too. So I don't think you need to check those. Yeah, the check marks it doesn't. But it like if I hadn't checked those, it left those two blank. So it's it's considering those two to be the separate items, I think. So let's go back and just check that. I'm <laughs> the warranty example so they must be making the argument that their one year warranty goes beyond quality assurance I think is what they're going to Because they specifically say that a quality assurance well see that's where i feel like that problem is kind of ambiguous because they specifically say covers product defects so but i think they're because the, because it's a year they're saying that goes beyond a normal level of a uh, defect prevention which that's kind of if somebody argued that point with me on a test question i would give you the point if you could make the argument that it's extended beyond normal product defect, defect time. Okay, 
Let's see here. Uh, signing a contract to design a fully automated wristwatch assembly line for $2 million, which will be settled in cash upon completion of construction. Install the equipment, furnish it with customized software package that is integral to operations, and provide consulting services that integrate the equipment with Precision's other assembly lines. So how many um, performance obligations do you think there are? One. And why do you think it's one? Yes, one of them is right. <laughs> okay, so I have a reasoning why it's one, but does someone else have a reasoning? What are what is the word that calls out why this would be considered one um, obligation? Yeah. Well, I don't have a word, but just the fact that they're paid a specific amount at one point in time. So it's not the one point in time thing because you could pay for like four things at the same time. But um, how about you? Have an idea? It signs a contract. Um, oh. you could have one contract that covers multiple things. All right. How about Gabe? Is it will? Huh? Is it will? No. Nope. Um, okay, so if, let me reread the key part. Uh, no, it's okay. It's, Nailed it. You got it now? I think so. Well, what's the word? Says, upon completion. No. <laughs> All right, I'll go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go. It's my turn. Okay. Precision equipment will install the equipment on the client's property, furnish it with a customized customized software package that is integral to operations and provide consulting services that integrate the equipment with Precision's other assembly lines. But, is it because they're benefiting from it? Like they're, they're like using it? It's because they're calling out that you can't use the equipment to the extent that you're purchasing it for without both the software and having it integrated into your other equipment. That's what they're going for there. If and uh, I believe they mentioned in the chapter specifically. Let's see. Um, where were we here? I know there was something somewhere that said. Um, if something is customized and can't be returned, um, that would be one part of it. Uh, but but here, because all of them, they're all occurring, um, they are all occurring generally at the same time, but before they can put it into use, um, they have to use the, um, they have to have the software to uh, even to use it and then it won't work uh, with their other assembly lines unless it's integrated there too. So. All of those services are basically delivering one end product that works with their other stuff. If it could stand alone, um, then it would be two separate performance obligations. So that's kind of the, the line drawing there. So I'm going to say, yeah, so one is what I'm going with. Okay. So let's look at this next one. This is another one, identifying the performance obligations. Aria Perfume sold 3,210 boxes of white musk soap, whatever that is, um, during January of 2024, price of $90 per box. They have a full refund if you're unsatisfied within 30 days. Based on historical experience, Aria expects that 3% of sales will be returned. How many performance obligations are there in each sale of a box of soap? I'm just gonna check. I know um, how to do this, but I wanna check and see if they have it in the slide here, because that's not even have to write it out. There we go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we'll we'll talk, we'll do the um right of return discussion here really quick before we go on to there. So typically, if you have a right of return, you're not going to get everything returned. You're going to have, but you probably will establish over time a historical understanding of how much of your product will either be defective or just disliked or whatever. Um, so people can return it. Now, um, what you're going to report is going to be your gross sales. So you're going to report all your sales minus any actual and estimated returns. 
So to estimate that return in that case, they said that typically 3% of those items will be returned within the 30 days. So um, here they've got a similar example. There's a thousand boxes, uh, 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 gaming boxes that they're selling for $240 each and 5% will be returned. This is basically the exact same thing as that soap example. It's just different product, different reason for not liking it. But either way, you got a small percentage of them that are going to get sent back, right? So you've got your gross sales revenue, which is the price of the box times the number that you're selling. But then you're going to subtract out what you think your estimated returns are going to be. So 5% would be $12,000, giving you net sales revenue of $228,000. All right. So um, when you are um, recording that, you're going to record essentially the amount less the expected that will be returned. And then you're going to watch it and monitor it after the fact to see if it actually gets returned and then potentially adjust it. So here, um, I wish they would have uh, put that in there for you, but we'll, we'll do it on our own here, right? So going out here in January, oops, I forgot my E. I'm going to put this this way. Oh, they only did one month. Okay, that's lame. They didn't even make us do the sub. They didn't even make us do the subsequent month. That's like, that's cheating. They made it easy. All right. So um, we've got, okay. How many obligations are there in each box of soap? That should be the easy part. One, right? It's a box of soap. Okay, so our, our generally, uh, our gross revenue would be what? $90 times 3210. Yeah, so 90 times 3210. So 288,900. Um, we just multiply that times the rate of return to get the amount that we think will be returned. And then um, our net revenue would be the difference between the two. So 280. I almost got like really excited here and was gonna show you like the 90 day breakout here. Cause I saw three lines and I didn't read it. And then I, uh... <laughs> so basically you're being conservative here. Then what happens if less than that ends up getting returned? Um, you might actually watch that and then say, okay, um, um, and, and record it later because you, if you've collected the money on it and then nobody ends up returning it, you have to account for the cash that you received somewhere, right? Okay. Let's see if they've got one that's more. All right, here's a contingent one. All right, so we're now we're getting into today's activities. Leo Consulting enters into a contract with Highgate University to restructure Highgate's processes for purchasing goods from suppliers. The contract states that Leo will earn a fixed fee of $250,000 and earn an additional $10,000 if Highgate achieves $100,000 of cost savings. And they estimate a 50% chance that they will achieve uh, $100,000 of cost savings. So this one, here's the expected value problem I was looking for, right? So we've got our base contract, and then we've got the um, bonus, right? And then we're going to need to look at what is the percentage likelihood of, so the base contract um, actually I'm going to do, sorry, I'm going to do it how they did in the slide base, uh, contract alone versus base plus bonus. Right. So, and they said 50%. Okay. For each of those. So the value of the base contract is the $25,000, right. And then the base plus the Bonus, okay, $10,000, so $35,000, so 25 plus 10. All right, so then we got to cross multiply each of these.
and then add them together. So, all right, so our expected value then becomes something that falls between 25,000 and 35,000 since it's, you could do this one probably in your head because it's a 50-50 shot, meets right in the middle. Transaction price for the contract then um, would be $30,000. Anyone have any questions on that one? This is really similar to like, so if you, who here has taken financial management? Okay, so this is really super similar to if you have like a portfolio of investments, what is the expected um, value or expected level of return that you might achieve? Same kind of concept. If you've taken, I yes. Yep. Where's the, um, the 35,000 coming from? That would be the uh, base price plus the $10,000 bonus. So 25,000 oh, plus the $10,000. Okay. So in general, um, what are they not what are they not telling us here about this uh um, this particular purchase here. Yes. What the percentage is as far as how likely it's going to be. Right. So, so there's an element of unpredictability and yeah. So this will actually go to, hold on. I want to skip forward because there's, I know there's a section on here on that. Um, I know there was a part in here somewhere. I'm trying to find it. Give me a second. All right, I'm gonna have to come back to that one because I know it's in here and I'm just not finding it, but I don't wanna sit here like scrolling through here for 20 minutes while we're, um, this one and the earlier one about the 50-50 uh, uh, or slightly better than 50%, we're gonna come back to this because I know I have a whole section in here on determining uh, based on like whether something is likely, more than likely or what not to happen, but we'll come back to that point and discuss all that in a group. Um, but what I do, so I will move on then to the, um... oh, here we go, wait, let's see. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if you don't have, um, I mean, probably what that would end up being in that case is a, um, if you don't know that it's going to be a return. Um, you would record what you know, which is your sale. And then, because um, normally you don't record a liability unless it's estimable, like you can estimate an amount for it. So they'll probably just have you take the whole amount there um, <clears throat> if you're unable to estimate the amount of the return. But we will come back to that one. Okay, so looking at um, another point that I brought up earlier, is the seller, is the person selling something a principal or an agent? In other words, do they have the capacity 
to sell this. So if somebody is a principal, um, their performance obligation would be to provide the goods and services, um, and they're also vulnerable to the risks associated with holding that uh, the items in the inventory, okay? Um, and when somebody is a principal, you're gonna record the total sales price paid by the customers, and then, and recognize the cost of goods sold. Now, if you are an agent, that means that you're selling something on behalf of somebody else. You don't actually own the item that you're selling. And so you would only record in your own revenue what you earned, what you're gonna net off of it. Like, do I get a commission? So who here has ever sold something on commission? Or uh, or I'm sorry, not commission, on um, 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 consignment is what I Lord. Okay, so you've sold. What happens when you sell something on consignment? Well, like you agree on a price, and then like when you sell it, they get their portion, right? Like they get like a portion. Like we agree on like sixty percent is what they get at our store, and then like when we sell it, if it's a hundred bucks, they get sixty dollars. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you're functioning as an agent, but you don't. Um, so. Do you actually pay them up front or does it wait until they get sold? It waits until it's sold. Okay, so you're not taking ownership. You're not buying the inventory from them. You are selling it on consignment. They could come back and say, oh, I decided I didn't want to sell it. I'm going to take this back out of your sales inventory and then keep it myself, right? So in that case, if you're acting as an agent and you sell something for $100 and 60% of that is going to go to the person who owned the product. When you record your revenues, um, what you're actually going to, or when you record a sale, you're actually going to be, you're going to show the full amount of cash coming in. But then you, instead of recording all of it to revenue, you're going to record the portion that is your commission to revenue, but then the rest of it goes to a liability to be paid to the customer. Okay. So. Um, so looking at how we would record that, um, we've got somebody buying a Tribox uh, gaming module from an online re retailer for $290. And um, there were two retailers associated with that, Printco and Agent Co. Can you guess which one is the principal and which one's the agent? Probably, hopefully, Printco principal. Yep. yep, got it. Okay. Thanks for coming along on the ride. Okay. Um, Printco purchases the Tribox modules from TrueTech to resell them. They own the inventory, right? But then they, uh, uh, and sometimes they have price discounts based on however they feel like putting things on sale. Agent Co. serves as a web portal where other companies can place their stuff for sale. And um, they take a $50 commission on each sale that happens through their web portal, all right? So theoretically, either Tribox or Printco could be selling through Agent Co.'s website, all right? <clears throat> now, um, when the revenue is recorded or when the sale happens, if it's sold for $290 by Printco, they're going to record $290 of revenue, less the $240 they paid for it for a profit of $50. The agent, on the other hand, records only the $50 um, markup that they get to keep because they at no point in time actually owned that property. So that's the key aspect is, is ownership retained by the other party in a consignment sale? So watch out for things like that, um, for that type of problem. So going out to our in-class example that we had here, then we've got a company that, um, so let's see. Oh, never mind. This is not the one I was, wait, hold on. Um, there we go. All right, here's the one I was looking for. Okay. So we've got Amazon selling the Mac MacBook Pro produced by Apple for a price of 1500 bucks. And then um, how Amazon works is that um, they are sending the stuff directly from Apple uh, rather than Amazon shipping it in this case. And customers are purchasing it via Amazon using credit cards. Amazon then forwards the cash to Apple equal to the retail price minus a $150 commission that Amazon keeps. 
So this is, in this case, they don't actually physically have, um, they don't actually physically have the items. It's getting drop shipped from Apple, but it's the same concept as a consignment. Um, regardless, the, they're not owning it at any point and um, the money is owed to Apple, right? So how much do we recognize for the sale of one MacBook Pro for Amazon? $150. Yeah, just the $150 commission. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's talk about how time value money is going to figure in here if we have long-term purchases, all right? So applying that wonderful chapter five that we all learned to love, right? Quote, unquote. <laughs> I have to be cheesy. You got to let me just do my thing. Otherwise, I'm just standing here talking about math all day, right? Okay. Um. <laughs> So if, so when do you think time value of money becomes a, a significant component? Interest. When, when you'd actually calculate some interest, right? So um, what happens when we're doing that is we're going to have two revenue components that we have to consider. Uh, if we have a long-term time, time value of money problem, we've got the actual product that we're selling which would be the normal cash price for that item. And then we've got a finance or interest component um, that we is, is inherent in the way that this sale is being set up, okay? So um, <clears throat> sellers can basically assume that the interest portion is negligible and doesn't need to be calculated separately if it's under a year. They could just say, eh, you're just, you're providing a one-year interest component. So like places like home furniture that offer free for uh, free financing for a year, um, they would not actually record any of the interest if somebody pays it off within the year, but if it kicks over and then they slap that additional interest percentage on top of it, they would instantly recognize all of that interest. It's actually a very efficient system if you think about it, because they don't even have to track whether the interest, um, um, they have to keep track of whether it's owed if they don't pay within a year, but. Uh, anyway, so we've got TriTech working with GameStop to sell some of their units. Again, $240 cost, uh, combined value of $960 for four boxes. And then um, in a prepayment example, GameStop pays TrueTech $873 on January 1st of 2024. So that's the, the sale date, right? When they transferred it in. And then um, TrueTech agrees to deliver the modules on December 31st, which is a year later, okay? So in this case, um, <clears throat> they're paying ahead of time, but at the time that occurs, they haven't really generated the revenue, right? Because there hasn't been any delivery. So they're paying on January 1st. Delivery doesn't occur for almost a year. So they're going to record a deferred revenue here until they actually deliver on this contract. But um, what's going on here? How did they come up with the $873 amount? Well, they took the $960 purchase, uh, normal purchase price, and they discounted it back based on a 10% interest rate here, okay? So if we're getting these problems, obviously we can't just take a stab and be like, let's try 10% interest and start plugging in random, random numbers. That won't work. They'll they'll tell us what the, um, uh, either we have to, uh, they might say, what is the inherent interest rate? But they would have to give us like, here's the regular amount and here's the amount that was actually paid in order for us to back into that, right? Just like in chapter five. Now, um, when the subsequent delivery occurs, they are going to pay the full $960 in revenue. The revenue gets recorded at the time that the delivery occurs, because prior to that, they just basically owe them a refund if they 
their entire inventory goes up in flames and they can't give them the boxes that have been prepaid for, then they have to give them their money back. Um, but what they would do then is the 873 that was in deferred revenue, they would debit it out of deferred revenue um, and then they would record the full purchase price. And then the difference would be the $87 going to interest expense. Okay. Now, so that would be the prepay prepayment example. Now we've got an example where we're gonna use a receivable instead of a prepayment. So in this case, same four boxes, same $960 value, um, same delayed delivery. However, they're not paying it on the front end. They are paying it on December 31st in this example, and they're paying $1,056. Okay. Oh, and they delivered the mug. So the other way around, they delivered the modules at the beginning of the year and then payment occurred a year later. So, so that's why the price is more. They've got um, a year basically of delayed payment that they're allowing this customer for. So then they're charging them um, a rate of interest. Now, again, they're they're saying, okay, 10% is the rate that we're choosing. So they're just taking the $960 times um, the discounted uh, present value factor. So notice they're not just taking it times the 10% here. They're, you wanna go for the um, present value function, which will give you not quite 10%, okay? Um, and then what they would do since they're not receiving cash here, they're debiting notes receivable crediting the sales revenue for the sales amount, and then the difference goes to discount on notes receivable, AKA interest revenue. Okay. And then when they collect it, it uh, debit cash, debit the discount, credit the interest revenue and credit the note receivable. So they're basically using that discount on notes receivable as an intermediary account to uh, record the amount they expect to receive in interest and then um, and then adjust that out into interest revenue at the time they receive the payment. Why don't they just have an interest receivable account? I mean, you could. You could just call it interest receivable. Yep. But just remember that the textbook wants you to say discount on notes receivable. I think, honestly, I think the difference, the reason why they're using that one is because they don't have a stated interest rate and they're, and they're um, inferring that discount rather than it being stated contractually in the purchase. Although you could argue that it's the purchase price. I mean, yeah, it's one of those things where you could probably argue it either way, honestly. You could say, well, why would they pay more for it if they weren't calculating interest on it, right? Okay, how are we doing on time? Let's see, do we have time to do this one? Yeah, we can We can do this problem 12 here really quick. We'll obviously be wrapping this up on Monday, not today, because we still have more sample problems, but, um, and a lot more topics. Okay, so... January 4th, or I'm sorry, January 1st, sale of equipment, delivery made on January 1st. So which one are we looking at here? Probably a prepayment or a receivables example. Receivables. Yeah, receivable, because they're delivering it up front and they are um, collecting it later. And the amount they're collecting is going to be $10,000. And that's going to be December 31st. And then assuming that the time value of money is a significant component because it's basically a year until they collect it, what would be the sales revenue here? How would we how would we go about this? We're basically calculating the present value of it, right? So 8%, 8% rate, one period. Um, the payment 
in no interim payments and the future value is ten thousand uh, dollars with end of the period uh end of the period so 92 59 26 is what i'm coming up with did they say rounding here nearest whole dollars okay so 92 59 all right so just like just applying what we did last chapter to uh this uh receivable example all right and we will wrap up on that